Welcome to the lighter side of the dark side. It's your weekly freak show here on Renegade Radio and all podcast catchers and I and YouTube. And uh, as always, I am Dark Mark, the goth comedian, and this is my co-host, everybody's favorite horror writer, Nicole Six. Hello. A horror writer. Okay. Yeah. You got to say writer in there too. No, oh, she has written, uh, she has written horror novellas and we will send you some if you'd like. Oh, great. Because you just can't say, this is my sidekick, the horror. You know? <laughs> no, she's not a whore. She's a horror. <laughs> <writer. laughs> That's what I'm saying, man. And She's you're like a laugh whore. Already. Dreams you're do like come a horror true, comedian. Nicole. What's that? I was saying that dreams do come true. Yeah. I was a 11-year-old boy in Westminster, Colorado, and my mother had Los Cochinos on vinyl. And we used ah. to listen to it all the time and laugh, laugh, laugh. And now I'm talking to one of my comedy heroes, one of my heroes, not only my comedy hero, the reason that I'm Buddhist today, and we'll get into all that, Tommy Chong needs no introduction, but from Teacher Chong, from that 70s show, from Half Baked, from being in jail, from <laughs> being back with Teacher Chong, the man's done it all. Being on the dark side to being on the right side, yeah. Now he's on the dark <laughs> side. How are yeah. you, Tommy? I'm fine. I'm really well. Thank you. You are a hero of mine. I can't tell you enough how grateful I am that you're coming on the show. And I've got a lot of questions for you. Okay, um, let, let's get let's get to it before you got me get me going on something where I uh, see I'm I'm at that age where I'm hard to shut up. You know? <laughs> Well, I, I am, I'm at that age, too, so I'm going to let Nicole ask the first question. Okay. I was going to ask, what is the most positive benefit CBD has had in your life? CBD? Well, it uh, helped me recover from my cancer operations. You know, I had uh, prostate cancer and rectal cancer at the same oh my goodness. time. Yeah. Well, actually, I got the rectal cancer from doing a biopsy for the rect for the prostate cancer which was stupid because it was obvious I had it so there was no need for a biopsy other than mm -hmm. to uh, do a medical procedure which everybody gets paid for and uh, that ended up giving me a rectal cancer and and I got operated on I didn't go the, the marijuana route like a lot of people wanted me to go. What I did, I went to uh, the best, I found the best uh, doctor, uh, surgeon you could find in that field. And, uh, but I use CBD to heal. And that's, that's great. when it, yeah, that's when it really uh, it came into being. Because after the operation, I was on the opioids, you know, the oxycotton or, you know, I never could figure out how to say oxycotton. <laughs> you know, the people got codeine or oxycodone or got or something. But anyway, it, it it's a powerful. It's like being on heroin, apparently. And I'd never done heroin, so I was kind of like really looking forward to it, uh, at least trying it. I've always wanted to try heroin, and so I did. And I see the danger because you feel so good, you don't even know that you've done drugs. Oh man. And, and so, you, you know, you just think, uh, well, with me, I had to hit a button because I was hooked up, uh, to, you know, automatic. And I'd hit that button. I wore that button out. But the minute I got out of uh, the hospital, I went on CBD uh, injection. And uh, that took away any desire for opioids. Totally. That's great. And, yeah. So that's that's my... Uh, uh story on uh, you know why i love cbd so much it, what cbd does it, it, it calms the mind uh, yeah th thc can excite the mind also calm it but the the cbd for sure calms everything and and when you're calm your body reacts you know not in a in a in an emergency way like when you get a, a any kind of hurt, see your body has to protect itself. And so if there's a bruise or something, it'll send blood to that area. Right. And it's called that's called inflammation. 
And so CBD, when it calms everything, it calms the urge to send all that inflammation to to that area. And that uh, that to me, no, that's me. That's my layman. <laughs> <laughs> you're hardly a layman when it comes to this tommy come on yeah but you know what i'm saying i'm not a medical guy I never, right in fact i never finished high school you know i'm one of those self-taught uh, kind of guys you know? but marijuana and gave you a career and saved your life for sure oh absolutely absolutely and and even before that it saved my life uh with cigarettes because uh i was a smoker right up till i was uh 21 you know, from 14 to 21, I was not a heavy smoker, but I, I enjoyed cigarettes. And then uh, I stopped enjoying them. And then I uh, finally decided to kick the habit. And that's how I did it with pot. I, every time I felt like a cigarette, I'd light a joint. <laughs> and, and, you know, and to this day, I still can't smoke a whole joint. Wow. I'll, I'll, smoke. What? I'll take a... I'll take a couple of tokes and I'll put it out. Yeah. You're just I, I a sw- lot of myths here, Tommy. Yeah. No, it's it's true. No, I I will light it up two seconds later. <laughs> you know, you know what I, I'm saying? I was gonna say I'm a social smoker. I can't finish a whole joint either. I like to be in a circle and just pass it around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's it's too much. Yeah. It's just too much. When you've had enough, that's enough. It's like whiskey or something, you know, a little shot glass. That's all you need is that little, that little shot, you know. But alcoholics, they take it to the, you know, where they get glug, glug, the whole bottle. And, and I found that with pot, too. Because I, I started I, I, I start making uh, uh, homemade bombs, you know, like, uh, like this one here out of uh, kombucha bottles. This one here. Awesome. Oh, yeah. See? See, and I and I got a, a great uh, Travis, a glass blower from Boulder, Colorado. He, he made the top for me. This is my new line. So I'm going to be, but you know, smoking a bomb takes energy. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you're gonna get the finger and the whole thing. Yeah. And, you know. and you gotta breathe. You gotta you gotta do that inhale. And then when you inhale, there's like a joint. You can take a puff. You can't puff on a on a bomb. Right. No, it's yeah. a big hit right away. <laughs> yeah, you got to draw on that bong, you, gotta, you know. Yep. And for heavy smokers, it's really good, you know. Uh, and or or if uh, tobacco smokers, if you're smoking, you know, out of uh, like a Chinese water pipe, uh, right? That, you know, you can you can get the coal hot enough so you can just take a little puff. But to get it going, it takes a lot of. Uh, lung power and energy and 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 that's a lot of uh thc being put in your system right uh, to, to me too much on a bong before taking too big of a rip like it really i can yeah. feel it from my lungs oh man i was on uh the snoop dog uh up and smoke tour uh, yeah you know he, he, i showed up uh <laughs> and he he got me on stage smoking out of a a six foot bong, you know. Oh my goodness! I was going to ask you what the biggest bong you ever smoked out of was. Yeah, that was it. That was it. And and I, because I was in front of a crowd, I had to show up, do my thing, and uh, <laughs> it almost killed me, man. Oh man! Yeah, everybody thought I was. Fool. Yeah, they thought I was acting the fool. You know, <laughs> you know, being a comedian. Oh, look at Chong with <laughs> writhing around on the stage and like he's dying uh oh that's a good act man that was for real dude <laughs> well, i see i see all the guitars behind you and uh yeah. i do want to get into this because i was telling my father about this and he had no idea i don't know if nicole or some of the fans know you are I, in the movies you play like a horrible guitar player but you are really a, a very talented musician good guitar player and wrote a top 20 song for motown records I did. I did. And you I wrote started out as a musician and you became very successful. Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, it's successful enough to know that that's not where I wanted to go. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it was always a dream of mine to do the chilling circuit, you know, because I was in a rhythm and blues band, you know, practically all my life. You know, I started, you know, real early at 15, something like that, 15, 16. And then I got you know, we we put a R and B band together, 
And then, you know, of course, I got turned on to all the R&B stars, you know, and and I met. In fact, we started our our R&B club in Vancouver by by hiring Ike and Tina Turner, the Ike and Tina Turner Review. And we had them for one night, a Tuesday night, for seven hundred dollars. That's wow. how much the whole review cost. Seven hundred dollars. Because it was a Tuesday night. In 1960. Right. It had to be sixty two or three around there. Yeah, sixty-three, probably around sixty-two, sixty-three. Yeah. Yeah. How was the seeing Tina Turner Live in nineteen sixty-three? And Ike oh Turner's no God. slouch himself. Oh, she was such a fox. Oh, so <laughs> hot. And, and all that. They, they had the whole review. I, the I cats and the review, you know, the Tina and the I cats and, and Ike himself and the band. 700 bucks. <laughs> that was killer. And then we played. Our band played because that was the whole point. You get a name to open the, the room and then we, we, we took over. But we were so popular that the city closed us down. <laughs> oh my goodness! What do you mean? <laughs> well, well, the, we 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 were we found this uh, what used to be a movie theater, and they turned it into a ballroom. Uh, the owner of the building, uh, because you know the movie the movie industry moved downtown, and so this was in the suburbs, and so it was uh, we called it the Blues Palace. And it was a pretty size, uh, you know, uh, it had a balcony, you know, it was a big, big theater. And they leveled the floor on the on the main main uh, floor, you know, and we had a beautiful, beautiful stage. It was incredible. But we got so popular that we drew all the hardcore teenagers back in the day and right. the hardcore uh, thugs, you know, for mm -hmm. want of a better word, you know, all the badasses that hang around, they don't go in the dance, they just hang outside and cause trouble and drink and right. and it was like uh, it was like a focal point for all the people and back then it was all alcohol there was no weed, I, I mean I I got turned on to weed real early, but I wasn't sharing it with anybody, <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> that was my own private stash, you know so everybody was into alcohol, and the next morning, that nice, quiet, suburban neighborhood was littered with beer bottles. Now, had, had I been in the club business, I would have taken advantage of it. I would have collected the beer bottles, made money doing that, and then I would have made sure that every time, uh, you know, we had a dance, that we'd have a crew come and clean that night, right. you know. But I, you know, I never had those smarts. <laughs> yeah, is it true that Diana Ross got you signed to Motown Records? Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, see, we had another club in, in Canada. Oh, by the way, that was the, the Blues Palace was the first and only club where we actually came up with the first and, you know, the, the deposit, the rent, and uh, the first one, the only one. No, I got, I take that back. We had another club in Chinatown, which we did. But after that, I, I you know, I, I, I failed at two clubs. And so right. I, we just went on the road and started playing music. And we got better and better. And so this one guy owned, he bought a building and it had a steakhouse in the basement, empty. And so he asked me, hey, do you want to, you want to put a club in there? And I said, Shh, yeah. And so he let me in there for six months rent free and uh, and that's where uh, diana ross uh, saw us because we had a it was an after hours club okay. and uh, and they played uh, they, they did the forum or you know some huge arena or something and then she came after that's where all the black people would come to our club because we had the best r&b band you know in the on the west coast actually and, well, and that's where half white half chinese guitar player yeah, yeah. Well, they they had no idea what I was, you know. <laughs> they, <laughs> but they didn't I've care, seen you know. I, 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 it's fun yeah. to me too. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, yeah. I, was, I really inspired the. China. I inspired a lot of people, you know, especially the Chinese community. You know, they love and and the Japanese and the Philippines. You know, oh, 
Oh, oh, oh, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, we just lost your visuals there, Tommy. There we no, go. I, I, I got it. Potential scam was the thing. But I, uh, yeah, and so we had an after hours club and everybody hung out there. You know, it wasn't just Diana Ross. We had, uh, oh, you know, all the great blues giants. Red Fox was a steady customer of ours. That's everybody. Great. Because at the end of the day, you know, you, you perform your show, you know, and, and, and in Vancouver, it's like you perform your show to a very nice, white, polite, white crowd. And then you come down to our after hours club and it was all mostly mixed, you know, <laughs> black, mixed, everything. And, yeah, and real it, was, fun. it was happening. It was happening. You could dance. And we had, you know, I was such an accidental club owner. See, see, that's just why I know the power of prayer really works, because I had no clue what I was doing, you know, but we somehow you just played by ear, you know, right. and, and there was an empty banquet room beside our club that wasn't being used. And our club was tiny compared to uh, most, you know, it was a small after hours club. It had a dance floor. And uh, but the overflow would go into the dining room, or into the the spare room that we had, which turned into a quiet room. It was genius because That's people, cool. you know, wanted to hit on girls, talk business, whatever. You had right. a room where you could go there, no loud noise, no waitress bugging or nothing. And so it was it was a good it was an incredible club. It, it ran for about I was saying five to seven years. That's great. Uh, yeah. And we did good. And then the guy sold the building. And because he gave us the club, we had to leave. You know, there was no way of saying, you know, that uh, we got grandfathered in. It wasn't we got grandfathered right. out. But uh, the other thing I hear, and we're, we're getting to Cheech Chong in a second, but I heard that Michael Jackson and Jackson 5 got signed because of you. Yeah, we, we discovered it. What happened when, when after we did Does Your Mama Know About Me, the hit record, we toured around the Chitlin Circuit and we played the Fox Theater in Detroit and, and Uptown Theater in Philly and all over the all over the place. And we played the Regal Theater in Chicago. And that's where uh, the Jackson Five had won a contest. And the, the winner of the contest were they got to open for headliners at the Regal Theater. And the, and the headliners was uh, Jerry Butler and uh, Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's. And uh, yeah, and and the we 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 were the first to really hear Michael and the boys. And they did a, they did a, a, a cover of uh, uh, My Girl, and they did a better version than the Temptations, if you can believe that. Really? <laughs> it was so well. Well, Michael. That voice, and he was a tiny little guy. He had like a, ten years old. Yeah, he had to turn the little coke carton over to, so he could see the mirror in order to comb his hair. He was sh he's short for his age, you know. He grew later, but uh, you know, in the beginning, he was a tiny little guy, and which made him so cute. And so we saw them, and uh, Bobby Taylor was the one that that uh, invited Joe and the and the whole the gang. It was only the boys and Joe to come and live with him in uh, in Detroit until uh, until uh, Motown, uh, dis you know, signed them. And so Joe did. Joe and the boys, they all came to uh, Detroit. And they had to wait a month before Barry Gordy got around to auditioning them. <laughs> and, of course, as soon as the audition happened, oh, my God. Motown, and that's what broke up the Vancouver's, by the way. Right. Because <laughs> Bobby went with the Jackson Five, produced her first album. Oh, okay. That, that was that was his reward, and uh, and then Bobby ended up becoming, you know, Bobby Taylor uh, with M Melinda. You know, he had. It's, a, it's a, so weird how the, the universe works. It's like, yeah, yeah. Ja Michael Jackson was supposed to go one way, and Tommy Tom was supposed to go another way. That, that's exactly it. Exactly it. You might now, not I realize a, at the time. I, I had a job at Motown, you know, playing backup band for Barry. Barry Gordy really liked me. Uh, uh, you know, we bought, we we were always we had a nice relationship, and uh, because I wasn't, you know, I was more or less straight shooter, you know, 
you know, there was no games or nothing. I wasn't trying to be anything. I was just right. who I was. And so I got fired from Motown because I had to get a green card. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I had to get my from, from uh, Canada. work permit. Yeah, yeah. And no one knew what it was. And so when I missed a gig to get, you know, to do the, the uh, what do you call it? The, uh, you get interrogated, you know, the meeting. Right. Uh, uh, when I came back to the gig, they had fired me. <laughs> and, and that was another plus. And Barry Gordy phoned up a couple of days later and said, no, you're not fired. And I said, yeah, I think I will. I, I, I'm going to stay fired because I want to become a Barry Gordy. I don't want to work for one. And that's when I really became Tommy Chong, you know. Right. Uh, you, you up until then, I was up until then, I was just a guitar player of the Bobby Taylor of the Vancouver. You know? Right. Now, I, I, I have to ask because I've heard a few different versions of this. But when did you meet Cheech? Cheech was uh, up in Canada. In fact, he was he he became a Canadian. Uh, he he became a landed immigrant in Canada uh, during the Vietnam War. Although he wasn't up there dodging the draft, he was up there as part of a, a secret army that was going to defend America if the Vietnamese attacked from Alaska. You know, so it was a secret army. You know, very few people know about that. But uh, in the meantime, he was uh, scuffing around. You know, he tried his, uh, his he tried to ski. Uh, that was the year before I met him, and he broke his leg that badly. And uh, and he was healing, and he was a writer for uh, uh, Poppin, a, a hippie magazine. And he was delivering carpets too for for money to to live with to right. eat on. <laughs> And uh, I had a, I changed a, a topless. Oh, we got another nightclub given to us. We were you just so can't successful. stop going to nightclubs. We were so successful with the after hours, the elegant parlor, that uh, another friend of mine had a nightclub, and his dad was trying to be in, get into show business. Chinese guy, he owned these buildings, and uh, and he. Uh, had a had a supper club in in Chinatown called the uh, Shanghai Junk, and uh, he gave it to me, and I turned it into a strip club, and then uh, I went on the road with Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's, right. and then coming back, when I was on the road with the Vancouver's, I uh, I I started I discovered uh, we're in San Francisco, and I discovered improvisational acting uh, the right. committee and second city I, I discovered in chicago's second city and in uh, san francisco was a committee right. and so i uh i that got was like fred told, willard and those guys or uh, well yeah yeah fred willard and uh yeah yeah uh all, all the great guys howard hessman howard, oh yeah <laughs> from wkrp yeah yeah howard hessman <laughs> by the way howard howard he, he went, oh, and so, I, you know, long story short, I changed the strip club into an improvisational strip club. The girls were still get naked once in a while, but it would be in, in the form of a skit, you know. And then at the end of the show, they would dance. We'd all, they'd all dance, you know, exotic dances. But it wasn't a strip club anymore. It was an improvisational comedy theater. It was more and, of a burlesque thing. Yeah, yeah, we, we were doing jokes out of Playboy magazine. Right. We would take Playboy, you know, uh, the improv club would, every improv uh, uh, theater, they would do a show, then they'd have a, a request from the audience, and then they would have an intermission, and then they would come back and do the requests that the people requested. And so I had the same format at my club. Uh, it was called the City Works, by the way. Right. And, and but the only trouble was our club. It was we never officially changed anything. We just went from a strip club to doing uh, burlesque comedy. <laughs> well, I, here, and, here's the thing, though. The thing about Chicha Chong that separates you guys to me from, say, you know, Smothers Brothers, Abbott and Costello, Lauren Hardy, even modern yeah. teams like Tim and Eric, and you know, people like that, is that 
to me, it's always been more of a, a sketch. It's like a two man Saturday Night Live, like a two man sketch, rather Absolutely. than like, okay, here's a straight man, here's the funny man. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we did that because we could. You see, and, and eventually, uh, we, we inspired. You know, we we definitely inspired uh, Saturday Night Live. You know, because Belushi was a huge fan, and he was already in Second City. And and then Second City tried to copy us. Everybody, the committee, everybody had to try to put out records like we did, you know. Right. Because because, uh, but we were sort of a hybrid. We we're, I was a musician. The National Lampoon and, Lemmings is definitely. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. They tried. They tried. They all tried. And that's where Howard Hessman really did, he hated Cheech and Chong, but. I think he liked me personally, even though, you know, they, they, oh, they, well, Hesman and, and, and those guys, they all had an attitude because they were actors, you right. know, and they weren't performers. They weren't comedians. They were actors and they were doing that because a lot of the, the committee stuff and that was acting exercises, right. you know, that you did in acting class. Uh, well, Cheech and Chong, I mean, I was just trying to entertain money, you know, keep people in, in a strip club uh, spending money. And, they don't and want laughing. an acting exercise. They, they need it. It has to be immediate. Yeah, yeah. They need it, the, the, the funny. They need it right away, you know. Uh, and and we eventually, you know, we became pretty good actors because Absolutely. just just from doing it, you know, just Absolutely. doing it all the time. That's <laughs> but Hes- yeah, Hesman. I was one time. I was uh, after WKRP. Uh, all those guys. By the way, uh, Chico and the Man. Remember that sitcom? Yeah, that was a total ripoff for you guys. Well, the guy uh, Jimmy Comax that wrote it. We got offered. Uh, we got offered everything at NBC. Brandon Tartikoff literally said whatever you want we want you guys on tv and so jimmy comax followed us around for three months and you know, watching every show that we did for three months and then at the end of the when they, they he had it together to do a show i i i i nixed it i said no i don't want to you know you lose once you become a, a sitcom artist you you lose control Right. You know, now the writers take over and the producers take over, you know, and, and the actors are the last guys they, they worry about, you know, right. <laughs> just just say your line, shut up, say your line, you know, that kind of attitude. Well, with me, I, I wanted to be a movie star. I didn't want to become a, you know, has been television, you know, comedian. Uh, and so so we turned it down. And so then uh, Comax called. Uh, old man, one of our bits, the old man in the park, uh, Chico and the man. And he actually apologized to me for doing it. He said, you know, I'm sorry, but, you know, it's a total ripoff. <laughs> but that's the way it is. No, okay, when another that, when question. That, when that goes on the air and there's a big hit, what do you think? Oh, congratulations. But I didn't want to be any part of that role, world. Man. I didn't want to be told where to go, where to eat, but, you know, when to get up, you know. When to rehearse, when to do all that shit. I, I, you know, teach night. We never, we rehearsed one time. <laughs> we had one rehearsal, and that produced our first bit. Dave's not here. And it after we did, it was a rehearsal. And and the the, the way it worked was that Cheech went outside uh, of the studio, and it was hot. It was little uh, Charlie Chapman movie studio, and there's a little enclave there that was in the sun and it was hot as hell it was hotter than you know it was probably around 100 degrees Mm -hmm. and he's out there knocking on the door well he went out there you know and i was he's supposed to knock on the door and i'm supposed to open the door and let him in but the the door locked from inside so so he's out there he knocks on the door and i was trying to record it so i said uh who is it and uh and then he 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 was, he was kind of shocked him because I was supposed to just open the door. And then he, it was a nice pause. He goes, it's me. It's me, man. Come on, open up. 
And so then I saw the beginning, the beginning of a bit. So then I, I waited and he knocked again. Oh, not no. Before that, I didn't know if I recorded it or not because after he talked, when he talked, I looked up at the door. And when I looked back at the recorder, nothing was happening. And so I'm <laughs> staring at the recorder and he knocks again. And this time I saw the needle jump. So I said, oh, it's recording. Yeah. So I said, well, we'll start the bit again. So I said, who is it? You know, more to piss him off than anything else. <laughs> and uh, and then he said, it's, then he got a little mad. It's me, man. Come on, open up. You know, <laughs> take the cut. But he, he never broke character. Never broke character. Great. And we did that. We did that whole bit. And fi finally, when I let him in, he was mad at throwing stuff around. I thought he was going to hit me. <laughs> and then and then I said, listen, listen, listen. So we played it back and we must have laughed for a, a, a good hour. We played it over and over again. And every time we played it, it got funnier and funnier. And then we recorded it that night. And then that was our first recording. So we had Lou Adler. We had everybody, engineers, everybody there. But the bit only took like a couple of minutes. <laughs> and then. Everybody's there. So what else you got? You know, because usually it takes uh, half a night to warm up before you get into recording. Right. And right. we'd already we already recorded the bit. And so then we came up with Blind Melon Chitlin. And uh, and then I realized and I took took Lou aside and I said, uh, we just need a little little situation like we had, you know, a little mixed down room and one engineer. And and then we did every, all the recordings with just right. the the three of us. Yeah. Now let me ask you a question for about a couple other things you turned down. Sure. Uh, I heard that uh, Harold Ramis wrote stripes for Cheech and Chong. I believe it. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Uh, they said it was. They, they said it was Cheech and Chong joined the army. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what they did, they 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 had it cast before they approached us. You know. And and we we are already knee deep in our uh, next movie, uh, Chief Chan's next movie. And the reason we right. call it next movie is because we uh, uh, we couldn't use up in smoke because we had split with Lou Adler by then. And so we were right in the middle of, of next movie, and they and they come up with with the offer. Well, you know, we're doing the movie already, and besides, you know. Again, working like Ramus or, and those guys would be like working for Petartikov, you know, being told what to do, where to go, how to look, you know, what to say, all that shit, you know. And so right. we turned that. And went, yeah, no, we turned that one down. We turned down. I, I just found out that we turned down a Howard, a Ron Howard uh, uh, movie, too. Really? Uh, yeah. What's what's Howard's partner, uh, Brian Glazer? Right. Yeah, I met Brian in uh, Aspen a few weeks ago. And uh, we had never talked before, and, and him and Cheech were good friends, but I, I'd never met him because I never, I never hung in that crowd. And, and right. he told me that, yeah, him and Ron came and pitched a movie to our to our producer, I guess so. Was. But uh, yeah, we turned down a lot of things. I heard that there was also supposed to be a Friday the Thirteenth meets Cheech and Chong. I never heard about that. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't doubt it. I don't. Apparently, doubt somebody it. pitched that, like uh, Teacher Chong meet uh, meet Jason, that uh, you guys were gonna be camp counselors. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I I did hear about that. Yeah, you're right. You're <laughs> right. Oh, oh, but you know, again, you know, uh, we turned down a lot of stuff. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I told Cheech just recently, you know, the only thing we never did was a horror movie. Well, but you know, I lost control of Cheech. See all the movies I had, con I had total control. But then uh, he 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 didn't like uh, he didn't like that, you know, because in the records it was equal, you know. Right. Uh, and but in the uh, in the movies you had to have uh, a guy in control, and that was me. Right. And that's why that's why we did next movie. You know, all, all those movies were. I gotta say that. And I've just watched them all in, in preparation for this, but Up in Smoke, Next Movie, Nice Dreams, Things Are Tough All Over, four of the funniest movies I've ever seen in my life. I can yeah. watch them over and over and over again. None of them have a yeah. plot. They yeah. are hilarious. Yeah. Well, that, Is that that's intentional so... that they don't have a plot? Uh, 
Well, if you look at it, uh, because it was it was the ongoing life of Cheech and Chong. They're doing that now with the, with the streaming, uh, with right. the, with the things now. You know, you think it's over? No, no, they got more to go. No, oh, no, no. You know, it's never over. And then they just stop. And that's what basically what Cheech and Chong. Yeah. See, up in smoke. Uh, Lou Adler was the director, and the reason we broke up was because Lou Adler, uh, you know, he, he got the best of him because I, I really directed the whole that whole uh, movie up in smoke, except for the the cop bits, you know, which uh, Lou Lombardo, the uh, what's the name, Robert Altman crew, uh, right? They, uh, they, and by the they, way, if people don't know, uh, Lou Adler. Great music producer, uh, produced Carol King and Beach Boys and just about everybody, and produced your records. Yeah. How did he end yeah. up as a movie director? Because we tried to, when, when I, I started writing a movie with another guy uh, long before we did Up in Smoke. And uh, because I knew we were going to go into the movie area. And then because Lou wanted us to keep making records and keep touring. And uh, and then it got to the point where it would, would, would have been our third or fourth trip to Australia. And I, I didn't want to do that anymore. It was too hard work. You had to write a new show. And you miss summer, uh, right. you know, you miss summer in L.A. And you, and you, and you're working, you know, and there was no break. And so I wanted to do do a movie, and so I worked with Joel Asker, and we wrote a, a movie with, which we never shot. It was uh, Jack and the Weedstock, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and so I was, I, but I never had a chance to pitch it. So Lou, when Lou heard that we were going to do a movie, then he arranged the financing. So he got in with the financing, and so so he financed the movie, and then we're we're trying to get directors and and uh, uh what's it rob reiner we, we we asked rob reiner but rob reiner was too connected with the committee he, mm, he was too wow. much friends with the committee so he turned us down and then we we ended up getting floyd mutrix who had done uh, american graffiti i think it was um you know some hot rod show but he didn't work out and so then lou said well paramount would be comfortable if he directed it you know, and, but yeah, you know, if he was like the director of name, you know, officially right. calling, making sure that it gets shot, you know, I, I got snowed all the way, by the way. <laughs> but, but you I, really directed up in smoke, not Lou. Yeah, Adler. I always believed. I always believe Lou would tell me stuff and I just believe it, every word he said. You know, I'm a Canadian, you know, I'm one of those guys. You know? And and you know when people tell me things, I I I, I don't doubt them. You know, I believe them, and I believe that. You know, but it was true because uh, Cheech and I were, you know, we up in smoke wouldn't have been do as good as it was if it wasn't for Lou, because what Lou did, he 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 brought the whole attitude of using names and and using real good people. That was his genius always. You know, I always at the top level. You know, it's like getting a shopper, and and they know what shops to go to. You know, right. as opposed to going to the easiest one. You know, Kmart or something. You know, you get guys that they they seek out these things, and that's the way Lou Adler is was is. Yeah. And, and you guys, guy. you guys inducted them into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so I guess there's no hard feelings. We we got what? Oh, we inducted him, Lou. Oh no, there was never hard feelings. Okay. Oh, even 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 after we broke up, uh, yeah, there was hard feelings because what happened up in smoke became a big hit, and and we and we got screwed financially. You know, I mean, I I don't give a shit about uh, any kind of uh, uh, you know credit who did, did what. I never did. You know, right. and that's but I, I had to take over the directing because uh, you have to be in charge of that shit. You know, if you don't, then uh, someone else you lay leave it that laying around, someone else will grab it like they did. Right. You know, but Lou, uh, no, no, we're good friends. Yeah, we're you know, I mean that 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 episode. What I always look at the positive thing because if it wasn't for that happening, we wouldn't have done next movie. We wouldn't have done, uh, right. you know, all those things are tough all over all, all those movies. 
And, yeah. and by the way, I, this is just my opinion, but I think Cheech and Chong should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. You have it's, more it's hit just, records than a lot of people that are in there. Yeah, it takes money. That's all it takes. <laughs> yeah. You know, but you that's why so many rock bands. Yeah. And you can even say that's, that Eric My Eye was the first punk record ever. Yeah. yeah. You can, for sure. For sure. Because we were inspired by by the before the Sex Pistols, you know. before the Ramones, and it yeah. was a top ten hit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for for sure. But you know, I mean, uh, it's 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 all about money, and uh, and, and by the way, they, they honor you in lieu of money. <laughs> 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 you know, you don't get paid anything for being being the guy. Yeah, oh, by yeah. the way, uh, they do that with comedians too, uh, like. They, they they wanted to honor me at Skirball. Yeah, they were yeah. they're gonna honor me, but they wanted me to do, you know, a half hour at least, you know. Right. <laughs> no money, no money, you get a plaque. Yeah, you know. And then they have a bunch of other comedians on before you, and and then, then you come on and you're basically headlining. You know? For free. But, I, but but I no, but I did because I, I'm not really a comedian. You know, I learned how to do comedy, but that's really not who I am. But you're a funny guy. Well, who I am is more spiritual. And whenever I get a chance, like if I'm on cameos or, or anytime or doing uh, uh, interviews, I will, I will jump into the spiritual rap right away. <laughs> right. And so when I, when I was at Skirball, you know, they had all these comedians and they're they're doing their shtick, you know, doing their funny stuff. I got up and I started doing my spiritual rap. And uh, and, and my wife was there, Shelby, you know, she was my comedy partner for so many years. Right. Uh, before after and before Cheech. Right. She stood up and gave me the cut. That's enough of that. <laughs> she, she she gave me the uh, it looked like part of the act, you know. <laughs> because, That's hilarious. Well, when she did that, then I then I sort of steered it into you know, so I had some punchlines where people could laugh, you know, and, and I did that. But yeah, yeah, no, I'm not really anything, but I can do a lot of things. Right now, and also, uh, Lou Adler owned the Roxy or owns the Roxy. He owns the Roxy, yeah. yeah. So every time I yeah. drive by the Roxy, I think of Up and Smoke. Yeah, and I do have a question for you about Up and Smoke. What two two questions? Why did Cheech play guitar, not you? And why were your drumsticks so big? <laughs> They're like baseball bats. I know, I know. Isn't that something? There, there's a most up rule. You know, you know, you you've heard the Wolf of Wall Street. You know, yeah, that guy. I was in prison with him, and uh, I was writing my memoirs, and so he he started writing his book. And he wrote a few pages and he, he, you know, he's younger than me and he looked up to me. So he had to be what he wrote. He said, what do you think? And I read it. And the guy's got a photographic memory so he could copy anybody, you know, and he copied Tom Wolf. And so I said, well, you, I said, to be honest, you haven't written anything, you know, you just copied Tom Wolf. And then he got a little, <laughs> he got a little defensive and he says, so, so what should I do? And then I told him the most of rule. And he said, what's that? I says, it's a movie. People are going to see a movie. They want to see the biggest and the best. You know, that's why you get the prettiest girls. You get the handsomest guys. You know, it's got to be the most of. It's got to be the most wildest car chase and the wildest everything. And so with Up in Smoke, if I'm going to be a drummer, I got to have the biggest drumsticks <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that they were on the market. And the reason Cheech played guitar, because he's singing lead in the thing. Right. I was never a good lead singer. I'm still not. I can sing, but I'm but I'm not a, a lead singer. And it looked better on screen because he, you know, because I I don't. I, in fact, I, I would never put my guitar playing on anybody because I I never really can. I still to this day I don't consider myself a guitar player. I I I know I can play guitar. And I've been playing since I was eight, nine years old. I used to be a second guitar or a backup guitar for a fiddle player right. when I was when I was young. And he he taught me what I know in show business today, you know, which is stamina. 
You got to have stamina. You got to be able to, you know, find out what you want. And if you don't get it right away, then keep doing it till you get what you want, you know. Right. And, and there's certain rules, you know, because a lot of people acting, a lot of in in all walks of life, they just don't try hard enough. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. And when you're when you're playing for a dance, you can't just say, "Okay, I, I'm tired now. I want to stop." <laughs> you got to go to the end of the night. Right. So everybody's left and gone home and you play the midnight waltz, you know, the last waltz. Then you can relax and go home. And, and the rule was, is that make it, keep it simple and give the people what they want. That was the two, two rules that I've followed all my life. And look where I am. There you, you're in a room full of guitars. Yeah, that's right. Now, is it, is it true? Is it? No, go ahead, Nicole. I was just going to say, I realized we didn't announce any of our sponsors. Right. Uh, uh, Raise Energy Drinks, the sponsor. Audible. <laughs> no, what's the drink? What's the drink? Forward slash the energy drink really good. Well, what is the drink again? Let me see. Oh, this is Raise Energy Drink. Oh, it's, energy drink. Okay. Yes. And what? Zero and what's calories, zero carbs, zero crash. Is it uh, uh, carbonated? A uh, little, very faintly. It's not. It's not a lot of carbonation. But it's refreshing. Yes, this is this is better than the stuff you'll get at the stores. Uh, you okay. can order a case on our thing. Well, 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 tell them because I gave them such a big shout out that they got to send me some. Okay. I was gonna say we would just send you some. Don't worry. Well, we, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got okay. stuff to send yeah. you. Don't worry about it. Uh, okay. What's the uh, next one? <laughs> some Renegade CBD and Kush. We got some stuff. We got some of that to send you. Oh, I, I like that. Yes. What, so today, what right before the show, I had the sugar-free gummies, and they're really good. They have a lot of new sugar-free snacks now. That's what Charlie's oh. been working. On. Oh, I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna try. Yeah, that. What they, else? Uh, you got? What, what yeah, else in my What else is in my goodie bag? <laughs> you're gonna get some raised energy drinks. You're gonna get some CBD, and you're also gonna get uh, Nicole's books. Oh, I don't know about that. I'll, oh, yeah, I have what, what, copies. I, what, I just don't want to books? force anyone to read it. You know what I mean? Like, if you want to read it, that's cool, but there's no pressure. There's what, is, what is the book? What, what is it's the called book? Some Fucked Up Shit. It's a, it's a collection of horror stories. Oh, I love it. I love it. My, my daughter makes horror movies. Well, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah, she does. Precious. And so, yeah, I, I, like, I like the horror, horror okay, stories. Okay, well, then I'll send you a signed book. It doesn't mean I as much as something that. signed by you, but I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> it means a lot believe for me. all the laughs you've given us that's the least we could do <laughs> yeah. I love it. is it true that dan Aykroyd directed some of the next movie a very tiny little bit Aykroyd and uh and uh, belushi were uh, were doing the blues brothers at the same time we were shooting next movie and so they they they, they were with john landis you know he's kind of nutty crazy right. guy and so Ackroyd and uh, Belushi decided to come and visit Cheech and Chong on the set. And we're right in the middle of, uh, of doing a scene and I'm Smoke supposed to be little, you know. No, 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 no we, no, we never had time. We we're too busy shooting. And I'm, I, I'm uh, doing a scene where I'm peeing in, on, on the neighbor's uh, flowers, neighbor's okay. flowers. <laughs> and, uh, and they used a, a hose and and so I looked at the, the because I was using video assist, one of the first to, to use it. And so I, I would, we were watching the playback and, and you could see the, the, the hand and the hose, you know, <laughs> briefly. And so I was at a, should I reshoot that or, or what? And Ackroyd stepped in, he says, use it. That's perfect, that works. That works really great. And I saw it again. I said, yeah, he's right. So yeah, he did. He did direct that part. Okay. And yes. uh, I got to tell you, uh, the, I've gotten some questions from some other fans. They all asked me to ask you about the woman that played Donna, Evelyn Guerrero. La Donna. Ooh, uh, La Donna. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, if you're looking at your wife or what, but Donna was in was in your movies and everybody loves her. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to know the story of uh, Donna? I so want to know the story. Ew. Yeah. Okay. 
when Cheech and I first came to uh, L.A., which had to be the uh, 1970, I believe, we ended up here. The only place that we could work, do an open mic night right away, was uh, Red Fox's uh, co comedy club he had on La Cienega. And I knew Red from the my after hours club, so right. I called I called down there. Norma Miller, she answered. Red was out of town, but Norma said uh, she talked to Red, and his Red said, "Of course, you know, anytime, he's welcome. You guys just come on down." And so they they, they did a spot for us. I think it was a Monday night. And so Cheech and I, Cheech was by the way, he was a big bear. He was having a vacation, and I had a you know. Here we are trying to make it and, and stars and teachers on vacation already. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, so I had a call or Cheech called me and I told him we got a gig. And so he, he came back from Big Bear and uh, we performed at uh, Red Fox's club. Well, in, in there was a, re, remember Lenny Bruce, the great. Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, Lenny Bruce had died. Uh, a year or so earlier, but he still had his entourage coming around. They had no leader, no one. Knows. So they were going to comedy clubs and Sally Marr, who was Lenny's mother, also right. managed uh, quite a few comedians, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so she, she was there and Tony Vizcarra, uh, Sally's actually husband, but she, she was, uh, years, years older than Tony. Well, Tony's uh, sister uh, was Evelyn Guerrero's mother. And so I met Evelyn when she was, a, I guess, uh, she was barely a, out of her a teen. She was still, wasn't even 20, I don't think. She was still a teenager. And uh, she was, uh, she's an artist. She was had a job coloring stuff. She was uh, what do you call it? Coloring gels in uh, animation studios. And that was one of her jobs. Anyway, she was incredibly beautiful and so funny and and so so hip, but beautiful. Mm -hmm. right. And so when we and then Tony became Teaching Chong's manager because at, when we performed that night. Uh, Tony came up to me and he gave me one of the nicest compliments ever. He said, you know, he'd been seeing comedians ever since Lenny died. And I was the only one that came close to Lenny, to, uh, the way Lenny thought, you know, his mind thought, mindset. And that was, uh, what, a, what a compliment. Well, I found out later that uh, Tony also had a drug problem. <laughs> <laughs> and he also was the one that that supplied Lenny Bruce with the drugs, and oh that was one of one of the reasons that was Tony's job. Even though he would sometimes worked the door when Lenny performed uh, in the clubs and that, but he was Lenny's guy. And so I met, so Tony and I become friends, and then I hired him. Uh, first of all, he was our manager, but we had to support him, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We had, I, I know a few managers like that. Yeah, yeah, we had to kind of support him. and uh, But he was with us all through our freebie area. You know, we, we'd perform here and there, and, you know, and we got, and he'd help us with the show. You know, he'd, he'd give us a little, a little bit, nothing. Actually, he was really good because he knew how to do it with Lenny, you know, just let us uh, work it out for ourselves. And actually, it was my wife, Shelby. Uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, and I just split up with my wife, and we were we were living together, and 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 she was she would come to the Cheech and Chong shows, and she would give us the best notes of them all, you know. Okay. And then she ended up in the show herself because she's she's got that that whatever it is. But uh, yeah, Evelyn, and then Evelyn, uh, when we started doing the movies, uh, anytime we needed a girl. We'd go to Evelyn, you know, we needed LaDonna because that was the other thing, too. I didn't want to use an, uh, like a name actress. I wanted to to use, uh, uh, you know, what I learned uh, shooting movies and that 
If you give people the first shot, they will give you 130% oh, yeah. of what they can do. And so uh, next movie, I gave the the uh, cameraman. He was a uh, King Baggett. He was just a cameraman, and he wanted to become a DP. And so he became a DP on my on next movie. And, and we, uh, Pee Wee Herman and Elvira. And uh, Santa Bernard. Everybody. Oh, yeah. Tom okay. Hanks is way. Rita, Rita Hanks was one of the uh, Help Me Wamba girls. Yeah. Right. Oh, tons of people. Uh, you know, the Ajax lady. We, we mean, uh, you know, and I love that because, like you said about uh, the punk scene, you know, that was new. And so we introduced that on, on screen. And that now it's legendary, you know. Uh, they, they, these did guys you, are uh, there forever. A reaction from the uh, from the punks? Do they like it? Do they not? Well, you know how punks are. You know they they don't like themselves. <laughs> well, I heard that the the germs actually did a, did a film something for Up and Smoke and they were cut out. Oh yeah, yeah. The germs. There was quite a few that did it. Yeah, we we could only go with a few, but yeah, yeah. We uh, no we. Like anything, you know, you got respect for what you are and what you do, you right. know, not not how you think, you know. Now, I, I've got just a, a couple more questions to ask if you can hang on. I really appreciate you. Uh, I mean, I could talk to you all day. I mean, this has gone by so fast. You were not, uh, you guys did an album. I mean, you did all the movies. You did the Corsican Brothers. You did Yellowbeard. Apparently had your European period. And then you did the album Get Out of My Room. Which had the big hit "Born in East LA," but you weren't on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That well, that kind of broke Cheech and Chong up, you know. Because why didn't you, uh, why didn't you do a voice on it? Because uh, up until then, you know, I had always when I wrote every anything I wrote, Cheech was always a star, you know, and uh, in lieu of me writing it, you know. I would, you know, that's that that's just the way I roll, you see. Well, when Cheech, now Cheech wanted to do his own bit, you know, he came up with this idea, and, and so I am, I was all for it, you know. Okay, what's my part? Well, I never had a part. Oh, <laughs> you no. Know? No, I was, as Chong, well, I never had a part. Well, she said he, that wanted, he wanted you to play the cop. Yeah, he wanted me to be the, the cop. But but I but I'm Chong, you know. Right. By that time, Sergeant Stadanko, though, on other records. Yeah, but that's a record. Yeah, I could be that 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 cop. But he but. Uh, I'm, so, I'm talking about the song. You weren't on the song. No, I know, I know, because of that. Because see, Stadanko, I wrote that. You know, I wrote right. Stadanko was Vancouver. I picked it out. I wrote the whole thing. You know, I wrote everything. <clears throat> uh, Sister Mary Elephant, Cheech wrote that. You know, right. that was his, his thing. I came up with the concept of something for the kids, and Cheech came up with that, and then I did the other one. But for the, uh, for, but the, again, you know, it's just like Tartikoff, you know, he wanted me to be a TV star, you know, but right. unless I've got, unless I am who I am, you know, unless you put some of me in there, you know, you can hire anybody. And that's what I told Cheech. I said that part can be played by anybody, you know. You did not write a Tommy Chong bit in there, right. you know, and 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 that's why, you know, it, it was disrespectful, you know. It was very disrespectful, and and that really led to us breaking up because then he he got the mood. See, see, I, I we, we attack anything. We attacked it with humor. You right. see. Yeah. And so when he did Born in East L.A., it was a story about a 15 year old kid that mistakenly got deported. OK, well, if I were to write the movie, I would have Cheech and Chong go rescue the kid, you know, and we'd rescue him with humor. You know, it would, it would be a funny situation all the way. Pretend he's our kid or whatever. You know, we, right. there's a million ways you could do it. You know, But Cheech had a whole different thing in his head and teach also to this day he still has a he he the character he played in up and smoke you know the, the, that made him famous he doesn't do that character you know he won't he won't look like that he won't wear the mustache you know, I was unless ask you about that 
Yeah, unless it's glued on, it's just, he, he treats it like a part. Louis, do you know who Louis Valdez is? No. Lu, Louis Valdez, he's the director that, I think he directed uh, La Bamba, I think. Okay. Don't yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway, he directed, uh, he's a uh, Latino, Chicano. Right. And, and he took Cheech aside right in the middle of our career and really gave Cheech a bad time about being, the step and fetch it of Chicanos, you know. Oh man, uh, come on. Yeah, I'm serious. I'm serious. That's awful. These are these are uh jealous contemporaries, you know. Yeah, they were very, sure. very jealous. And and so they they really taught Cheech out of doing that that uh, Pedro character, you know. That's which which Cheech created. You know, right. it wasn't that I created and say, hey Cheech you gotta do that. In we fact, live in LA. You go down the street and find ten cheeches. That's what I'm saying. So I, when I or Pedro's, when right. when what and the way we discovered that Cheech don't even want to admit the way we discovered it because the way we discovered it when we were up when I was up in Canada, Cheech was Richard Marin. He wasn't Cheech. He, his name was Richard Marin. Right. And then we put a band together, and then when we never when we got to the gig. It was a battle of the bands and we were going to do a little comedy and then we we're going to bring the band in. Well, he never got around to play because the <laughs> comedy was so strong. Right. And the band never, and the band, they're a good friend of mine. Powder blues was the name of the, the band okay. that they were, they were from. And they, <laughs> these were the next gig boss. I said, no, <laughs> it's just, just Richard and I. Right. You know, now Richard Marin and Tommy Chong. And so coming home that night, we were looking for a name. And then I finally said, Cheech, don't you have a, a nickname? And he said, yeah, Cheech. And Cheech and Chong, I mean, it just flows off the tongue. Right. Yeah, so he's really does. Cheech and Chong. And so that was it. You never but consider Cheech, Tom and Cheech? But, but Cheech never, no. Cheech never really wanted to be Pedro, ever. Right. To, to him, you know, he was educated. And so when, when it came down to working in the Valley and we weren't going over, we, we had to do two gigs in the Valley at the Irma Cafe, it was called. And they, uh, the first show did not go over well because they were, they were dancers. They, were, they wanted to dance. They didn't want to watch comedy. And so I said to, to, to Cheech, I said, there must be a character we can do that will get these people. And Cheech said, yes. And now he denies it, that denies it, but I was there. I know exactly what happened. He said, uh, yeah, there's a character, but I don't want to do him. I said, why not? He says, it's, it's kind of detrimental to the, to the Chicano community, you know, Latino community. And I said, Cheech, we're, we're comedians. That's our job. This is what we do, you know? So he said, well, okay. I, so, so what, I said, just, Tell me what the what what's the character? He says, "Well, he's you know the there's a guy. We're standing outside the club, and this Chicano pulled up in a lowrider. You know, he goes, hey man, can you can you tell me where uh, Encina, uh, Rosita Boulevard or something?" And and she says, "You're on it." And he goes, "Oh oh, thanks, man." And he drove off. Well, she says that character. Right. So then then we put a, a bit together. This old. Like like a lot of our comedy was old uh, memories of me working in black clubs right. and remembering bits that black guys did. There's one bit where this black guy went on a date and he drove a car, but you never saw the car, it was just a chair. But he would make the car appear with pantomime, you know, maybe right. polish it, and do all that stuff and get in, got gear shifts, all that. And so I showed Cheech a little bit about that. And Cheech, right away, he understood, you know. And so that's where the lowrider the lowrider character come in and so then i wanted to play the opposite of his lowrider and so i became the red freak you know the guy that was so stoned he couldn't talk you know <laughs> and and i was the opposite cheech was really quick and fast hey what's up baby and i was like, hey man i was the, the slow guy and and that magically became the formula that really made uh made us uh, who we are today you know right. yeah huge partnership and, and Very so when, when, when we got very uh, successful, 
then Cheech had a meeting with uh, Luis Valdez, and and they decided that Cheech would not be doing that character anymore. I mean, Cheech denies it, you know, but I I know that's what happened because I was there, you know. And we turned down. Uh, when we broke up, there was a lot of movies that wanted to be made, like just talking about Stripes. Well, you know, like the Corsican Brothers was another one that where right. Cheech says he didn't want to do any more stoner movies. You know, so right. the Corsican brothers was there was no no dope in it, much to the dismay and the chagrin of the movie. Oh, the guys that bought the movie because they only bought Corsican brothers because we were going to do a doper version of that. But right. I, but I, I, you know, I said, you know, we're talented enough. We don't need to have anything to lean on, and we did a, a nice job with the Corsican brothers. And a lot of people to them, it's their the only movie they relate to. You know. I so, know, I know a few people that uh, that's a, uh, they they don't like your other movies. They like that one. Yeah, yeah, because they don't understand the doper humor. Yeah, it was the taste. So, so we had a whole career ahead of us, you know. But, but even in the Corsican Brothers, that's when we broke up. That's when because uh, Cheech was getting a divorce from his wife Ricky, who I insist, who I insisted putting in putting in the movie, because I wanted my wife in the movie. So what I did, I put his wife in first his wife was in in uh uh what which one nice dreams was it nice dreams no things are tough all over things are tough all over that's right she was ricky was the first and 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 then my wife shelby was in uh nice dreams just uh in the weightlifting scene right for, for for a second and then they were both in uh uh, uh, things are tough all over, and then they were both in. They were becoming like a a female comedy crew, and they were both in the Corsican Brothers. But right. but Cheech and Ricky broke up, and 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 that and that's when we that's when Cheech bro- and I broke up because he really wasn't he 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 was done I guess with right. the Pedro character. He was totally done with that, and. Uh, and you know, I, I still I still love my stoner character. <laughs> right now, how'd you guys end up in Martin Scorsese's After Hours? Again, you know, the word went out. We were hot. We were very hot. You know, I had Katzenberg fly all the way to Vancouver Island to get me to be in. It came from Hollywood. <laughs> he flew up right, there with right. the yeah. He flew up there on. On a prop plane and all that. He loved it. He showed up and called him knocking on my motel door. I was at my mother's funeral and uh, Katzenberg couldn't get a hold of me, so he flew up. <laughs> and, you got to be in our movie. I was okay. Yeah. So that's how we, that's how we were with, uh, with Scorsese, too. You know? so Scorsese had a lot of respect for us, but the whole movie industry right. had nothing but respect. For for Cheech and Chong because of our box office uh, ability, you know, and right. uh, and that's that's why we we were in uh, After Hours box right. office, yeah. And then you did Far Out Man, which I think I it, it, it's um, as as with Born in East LA the movie, um, it's good. But if the two of you were both in, and Cheech is in it, Cheech yeah, in for a Far second, man. I, oh man, I almost. He got on my knees to, to beg him to, you know, to, really? to, to be in it. And uh, and he, he said, no, he wouldn't do it. He, he would not do that character. He would not be that character anymore. He was done with it. And, uh, yeah, he was totally, totally done. And that was basically the, the swan song for, for Cheech and Chong, you know. Right. How did you, I, how I, did I, you I get did him to be in the Far Out Man? Like, you just... No, I, I, you know, I, I, I never, I never had any grudge against Cheech at all. You know, never. You know, I always loved him like a brother. And it was, it was heartbreaking when we broke up. You know, right. And then, and then I hadn't seen him for so long. You know, and then, then when we see, because for a while there, you know, we were so close that we knew what we were thinking. Each other's were thinking, right. even when we weren't together. That's how close we were. You know, and it wasn't until he he uh, I actually I went to Europe, you know, I, I lived actually lived in Europe. And that was when uh, and Cheech was by himself and Cheech felt the same thing. He once flew to to uh, just just spend time with me, you know, 
uh, in France. Um, in fact, uh, the coast of France, we're at uh, Arcachon and, and Cheech already he flew up there, you know, just so we could spend some time together. You know, we, we were that tight, but we, we grew apart. And then after we did uh, 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 Still Smoking, that was supposed to be a concert movie. Right. And, and, uh, and, and again, I, I told everybody, I, I make, I'm not a, you know, I don't do concert movies, you know, and I, I just do, uh, and I said, give me the money, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a real movie. And it made more money than I think all the concert movies. I think sure. maybe Eddie, Eddie, uh, Ra did, did right. as good, as good as ours, but ours made a uh, shitload of money. Because I know think you could, we, got, uh, we got checks. Did you think you could be as, as big a star on your own? No. You never did? No. I never did. No, no, no. You need that. You need that thing. No, a, a bigger star, but not in comedy. You know, right. not, not like comedy. No. I, I, actually, I'll be a bigger star probably with my spiritual. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm big, bigger than ever. Like my, my, uh, uh, CBDs and stuff like that, you know, right. because figure out you got a not only a, a, an icon with a with a comedy team, but now I got I'm I'm talking about stuff that really affects people's lives, right. you know, you know, not just make them laugh. It affects their lives, and you know, it gives them uh, a path. It gives them uh, purpose. I do yeah. more cameos than you can imagine. I can just imagine. because yeah just because uh you know sitting at home uh and doing cameos i i made more money this year than i've made in in, in eons <laughs> a lot great. of years That's yeah great. now i um i gotta tell you the the scene in far out man where ronaldo ray snorts the, the fake cocaine one of the funniest things yeah. i've ever seen yes yes isn't that great yeah and then but, and the way we brought him back to life with him uh, with a short in the guitar <laughs> You gotta, if you haven't seen it, you gotta see it. But you know, that was uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard's favorite movie. That's uh, awesome. Boxer. Yeah, he would, he would uh, sit alone because it never got the <laughs> hype. It, it, it never got the hype, you know, all the Cheech and Chong movies got. In fact, it, it probably got the opposite hype, you know, Cheech is it in it, so don't bother. But, but uh, yeah, no, oh, no, I had so much fun. And, and it's kind of, uh, kind of special the movie because it was the only time only recording of bobby taylor mm. you know, and bobby taylor died uh, wow. a few years ago and and that really is the only uh uh i think maybe some tv work that bobby did you know singing but wow. as an actor as an actor uh that was the only uh thing of Bobby and also Floyd Sneed he was the drummer of the Three Dog Night yeah he's okay. in it too yeah he's in that movie too well, that was my uh, your entire family in it oh of course I, I, I everybody was in it yeah yeah, yeah. well I, ha I have to touch on this and I know it's sure. probably a sore spot but no I when I got this book I thought it was going to be like a Cheech and Chong autobiography and what it was was a, a document a document of your Jail time when you were, yeah, put in jail for, for having somebody else ship bongs <laughs> under your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can crazy. you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Well, you know, I so pissed crazy. off. I pissed off uh, uh, Ashcroft. Who right. Was a, he was Attorney General. I pissed him off. He lived in St. Louis, and he was a big right wing radio guy. Well, I, over the years, I became the darling of right wing media because I would piss everybody off. As soon as I was <laughs> on, the phones would light up. Everybody would be pissed off. Well, I pissed Ashcroft off because I would I would out be the right wing guy says, "Oh, the pot's bad for you," yeah, you know, the, you know all the stuff, and I'd say, "Oh man, a lot of a lot of famous people smoke pot, you know, that you don't know." And I would just name up people, left and right, you know, I, I no no proof for anything. Like I had a friend, Danny Sullivan, the race car driver, and so I said, "Oh, Danny Sullivan, he smokes pot. I've smoked Arnold pot." Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
than his, well, Arnold, he does, but Danny Sullivan never did, you know, right. or, or not in public, you know. <laughs> and, and so it would piss off the right wing guys really bad. And, and I think I got to Ashcroft and, and, and I think I got to the Bushes too, because uh, apparently the Bush girls were heavy potheads, you know, and they, they liked the Tommy Chong bongs, or, you know, oh. the Chong bongs. And so I mean, George we, W. Bush was a, was a coke addict. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, you know, they all done pot, you know, whether Pots they do it or not. Yeah, they all. Yeah. And especially uh, Obama, you know, he. he he knew oh, Chi Chi Chong. Yeah, he knew Chi Chi Chong before anybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But anyway, the um, yeah, yeah. But the the Iraqi war was such a disaster. Yeah. The, the weapons of mass destruction. They're looking for something to take away the news cycle, you know. And so Tommy Chong going to jail for bombs. I, they figured <laughs> it's a typical George Bush move. You know, like you make a crack about uh, weapons of mass destruction, and uh... yeah, yeah, yeah. I said the only weapons of mass destruction they found were my bombs. And next <laughs> thing you know, the judge is going nine months in jail. You're going. <laughs> I was wondering. I, I knew you didn't get that long. I was wondering how much you got. I've been in jail for six months. I was in a fight once. I. uh It's not my proudest moment. I won the fight, but I went to jail for six months. So. Oh, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but while I was in there, I was super focused on what I wanted to do with myself. I helped better myself. I got into programs to enrich my life and give me like a future when I got out. Like I took it very seriously. Like I didn't want to be that person, you know. You need to yeah. read this because well, well, the whole the whole point when when I was in there, my uh, brother in law sent me the Yi Ching, and oh, so I threw it. I I threw the Yi Ching immediately, and the Yi Ching says you're in jail for a reason. Exactly. And it says, it says, uh, jails are where you go to co corrective institutions are, you go there to correct your behavior. Yes. And, 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 and I read that. And, I, and then I also realized that jail is the only, uh, hospital for poor people, uh, homes, I know. Uh, schools. Yeah. Schools is the only place you're going to get schooling. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're going to get uh, uh, and, and be protected from from obvious violence, you know. Uh, uh, you know, for the most part, if you keep your nose clean. I, I've known many, 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 many people who would commit crimes just to go back to jail because it was yeah. the only home. Right. It's the only home they know, you know. And so when they got these programs, you know, get these people out of jail, you know, the ones that never been there, they don't realize what they're saying, you know, because uh, it's not that, you know, they're not that anxious to leave. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's not like they got a life outside, right? You know, especially Besides, if they've been there long enough. Their only life they know is inside. Yeah, you know? like there are many people that are homeless during the winter months that commit crimes in order, like small things like theft or something, just so they can yeah. be in jail and have hot meals. And big things like, uh, what do you call it? Those uh, chases, you know, those car chases. You yeah. Know, that's what it is. Uh, they, in fact, in, in prison, they call it something like uh, uh, going on vacation. That's oh, okay. What it is. <laughs> yeah, when, when you get out of jail, you go on vacation. Because now... You got license to rob, steal, whatever you want to do, because you're going to get caught and you're going to go back. Yeah, and, that's and, sad. So, and so they do all that, you know, and that's why they drive the crazy the way they do, you know. And, and but well, that's there's a our lot system. of resources in there too, though, to help you get straight. Like, I yeah. wasn't really a violent person. I had a fight with a person. It's like my only crime in the 35 years I've been alive. But I also had a temper, and there was a lot of stuff that helped me get calm and centered. I really appreciated yes. that. Yes, it's a timeout. It's it's yeah. You both got put on timeout. But yeah. the one thing yeah. is that if they were trying to crack down on the drug trade, it backfired because I have a theory. Uh, I think that the outrage over your sentence, and you were the only one sentenced out of all the people that were charged. The outrage over your sentence has led to where we are now, yeah. where you can get marijuana delivered to your house. Yeah. Yes. Would, but legally now. Hey, they closed down bars. 
<laughs> they closed down concerts. They closed down uh, sporting events. What's open? Marijuana clubs. <laughs> <laughs> Where you That's buy right. your pot. Dispensaries are always open. Where you buy, you buy your pot. Like you said, you get it delivered. I used to joke about it. I, you know, they said about legalization in New York. I said, well, right now, uh, you can get pot faster than you can get pizza delivered to your house. <laughs> <But then you'll laughs> because I've ordered, I've ordered both, and usually the pizza comes first, you know. No, I mean, the pot comes first, which, thank God, then you well, can that's eat good. And you're hungry for the pizza. Yeah, they that's like right. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, can you imagine, I mean, from the time you were put in jail to now, it's, you yeah. know, which has been, what, 12 years or so? It's uh, oh three. I was in there oh three. Oh three. Oh well, you know, longer than seven in the seventeen years since. But even yeah. just the last ten years, it's. I mean, it's it's uh, across the country with very few exceptions. Yeah. People are like, yeah. We want to make it legal. Let's make it yeah. legal. Yeah. And the ones that don't, oh, they're they're ostracized now. Like, oh, what are you crazy? You know, you don't want that 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 good pot money. And and you know what really bugged me is when they. First of all, we got it legal med medically. Now there are places that they want to eliminate the medical and just call it recreation. And now that, that, that's a little bit going the wrong direction there, folks. I agree. <laughs> because it is a medicine. It will always be a medicine. And if you use it recreationally, you're using it as a medicine. Right. You know, yeah. there's no recreation involved anywhere near pot. You know, if, if anything, yeah, it'll make you uh, sharper and think, you know, a lot of people, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would do a couple of tokes, you know, before he'd play basketball. Uh, I'm quite sure 99% uh, of the players in, in, in the NBA do that. You know, right. Calm, calms their nerves, you know. Uh, yeah, that, that girl that got Simone kicked Miles, off. She, she could have she used it. She should be using it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a medicine. It's a medicine. And and I have to tell, you know, I, I tell a lot of people, you know, be careful with it. You know, do the rat test. You know, people say, what's a rat test? Well, when rats find something they're not sure of, they just take a tiny little bit and then they yeah. crawl away and they crawl away and they see what happens to them. And if it's OK, OK, then they eat a little more. And if it's not okay, then they'll <laughs> they'll leave it. They okay, I'm not going near that, you know. And rats are the closest to, to humans of all the animals, you know. That's why they use rats and uh, experiment for medical purposes. So you do that with pot, you know. If you're afraid of it, do a tiny little bit, tiny little bit, right? Because that's that'll get you off. I, I used Tommy to, Chong, he's been medicated. For 50 years plus, he knows, make sure you're doing the right dose. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 if, and if you're the one of those guys that can, you know, puff down a, a gram. Like I was with weightlifters, bodybuilders. Right. You know, and with Arnold and that. And they would go over to Zabel's house, his other bodybuilder. And they had a, like a big ass bong. And they would put an eighth in the bowl and fired up with a torch and the whole trick was to suck it in so that the 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 coals would go into the water and explode right <laughs> and, they were, and they would and, that would hurt you me know, <laughs> all the the dave drapers of the world you know they got the big lung capacity you know right they, right. they can <laughs> the bench press 500 pounds you know that would hurt and, me so bad <laughs> and, and then they would then, then it was my turn and i took a little my little one <laughs> little toke, little chicken shit toke. <laughs> there you go. But do hey, it. Man, Tom's a lightweight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm. A, I don't mind being a lightweight, and I tell him all the time too, man. You know, when I when I was a kid, we never knew when we we're going to get our next bit of pot. Yeah. And so you just, you know, I nursed a joint one time for a month. I take that toke, put it out. Take a toke, put it out. That's <laughs> that's two days there. See, just take wow. a toke, and, and that's how I, I got into comedy. I listened to Lenny Bruce, I, uh, one little toke, just a little toke, and then put it out. Yeah. But when you're I'm around still... like like 
Kevin Smith or Snoop Dogg or Mike Tyson, they all want to just like outdo you and see how much weed you can smoke. And that's, I mean, what do you say? Like, hey, I just, I'm just having a little bit. No, 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 no. I, I can, I can fake it like a dog, man. I'm an actor, <laughs> man. I can, <laughs> I can puff, 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 and not inhale anything. <laughs> just puff, puff, puff. I can burn all their weed to the shit if, I, if, if without even taking a toke, you know. Oh, wow. Or, or yeah, or, or like when I was on the, the Trailer Park Boys, right? And they, they, they had a contest, and I kept taking the bong and I kept giving it to the other guys and they, and they wouldn't resist it you know I got them I got them all so fucked up they, they, they didn't know where they were and, nah, we finally found then, the secret and then I said you won you guys are the best yeah you helped smoke Tommy Chong <laughs> but uh by the way uh the, your cameo is Alfred the Butler and uh Jane and Tyler Bob reboot is the funniest thing in the movie. It's hilarious. It's That's great. a funny movie. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, we had fun. <clears throat> we had fun. See, Kevin, he, he's the director, and he, right. uh, yeah, he, he knew exactly how to direct me. Beautiful. Yeah. But he's stoned. Well, it, it, there was no script. It was a conversation. Right. And then, and then he knew he knew how to do it. He knew how to work with people. See, it's a new world now. You know, that's why. By, I, by the I, way, were you, were you in this? I don't. The way it was shot, you were not in the same shot as Val Kilmer and the, no. the girl played Supergirl. You, they did all the three shots separately, right? Yeah, I know it. Yeah, because I saw uh, I, I saw Val in the makeup room. That was sad because he, he can't talk. He's got no voice. Uh-huh. Right. And he and he writes on a pad. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah, I had a. a, a, a I guess a cousin that was, they called deaf and dumb back in the day. Right. When I was a kid, he was both. And oh, he would he would go through changes and he can't couldn't talk and he'd do it with his hands. And, right. Well, it was pretty sad. And Bell's at that stage now. Yeah, he's, I saw the documentary. It's, uh, um, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. Uh, but he seems to be dealing with it uh, pretty decent, pretty good. So, uh, you he, know, he's, he's Val he Kilmer. He's Val Kilmer. It's another character. Right. Val Kilmer played some of my favorite roles. Like he's just amazing. Like I will always remember The Saint as being like this really great film I watched growing up. Yeah. 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 Oh no, he's he's. Uh, he's and of course, actor. you know Jim Morrison. Like he, no one else could have done that but him. I think. No, he's a legend. He, he's a legend. Maybe and he Tom, always but, uh, I got two more questions, and you've been so generous with your time. I really appreciate it. The first question, there's got to be a whole generation of people that don't even know you from Teacher Johns, that know you from Half Baked or that 70s show, or just, you know, just hanging out with, with the, you know, uh, Snoop Dogg and things like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Do people recognize you on the street? They're like, oh, that 70s show. Oh, they, it's, it, it varies. It varies. And, and I'm very happy, you know, when I meet them. Like I was in Tofino up in Canada, and it's the furthest west that you can go, and the most wild, and and I got recognized like crazy up there. And you know who recognized me? They were Serbians from Serbia yeah. that had married Croatian women, and if if you did that there in their country, you could get killed because they were like mortal enemies, right, and right. so they would they would get their wives and come to Canada. And they're the happiest people in the world. Oh man, I love my fans. I got, I, I, I think I, I really do. I think I got the best fans uh, of anybody. Which I grew up around a whole generation of people who love half baked. Like uh, it was, it was the thing. I was like, <laughs> which leads me to my yeah. last question: What is it about Chicha Chong, in particular, that transcends generations, transcends race? Everybody likes you guys. Black people, white people, uh, yeah, Spanish, everybody well, likes you. Well, you know, we, we took a page out of uh, Charlie Chaplin, you know. when Charlie Before Charlie became the tramp, he was uh, a very renowned sort of uh, music hall musician. He's a composer, a, a very elegant, very highbrow uh, guy. But he couldn't make a penny doing that. 
And so the minute he discovered the tramp, it was a character that he discovered. Then he realized one thing, everybody looks down on the tramp. And that was the Cheech and Chong formula. Everybody had a Cheech or Chong in their family somewhere. You know, everybody, not just, you know, uh, stoners or, you know, everybody, rich, poor, whatever color there is. There's, <laughs> there's the, 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 the two fuck ups. And, and, and that really was our, 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 our success story. I, I realized that. You know, and, and when we did Up in Smoke, I realized two things. I realized that the, the characters w would be eternal. That's why you can never kill them off or you can right. never change them. You know, the, when that's what I'm talking about. When Cheech did Born in East L.A., he changed it. And when he did that, he just cut himself off. You know, had he stayed the, 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 the low rider to this day? Because old, there's old low riders with the with the mustache. Yeah. And, hey, what's, going, what's happening? What's happening, man? Hey. And I was going to, in fact, when I was working alone, I had a whole bunch of those guys come up one time. I worked in Brea, California. And and they were, they didn't approach me, but they stood off to the side. And they said, hey, man, what's, what's with no cheech? No. Oh. Hey. <laughs> What's with no Cheech? Where's Cheech? And, and they weren't saying, where's Cheech as far as Cheech himself, but as far as my mindset, you know, right. and yeah. the, way, the way I delivered, you know, the way I would talk. Because I, I got kind of bitter, you know, and I would uh, do do not very nice jokes about Cheech, but, you know, and, uh, him and Don Johnson, you know, I, I'd brag on that a little bit, you know. But I realized that who we were means so much to these guys. Yeah. You don't, want, you don't want to mess with that. You don't want to mess with that. And so I, I learned right off the, right, out, right, right after that incident, you know, just like on the road now with, with Trump, we, uh, just before the pandemic, right. we started getting these heavy Trumpies and they were, start, they started, well, they actually started heckling Part, you know, when I did Does Your Mama Know About Me, uh, Cheech and I sang it, and then I, I heard this Trumpy yell real loud, boring, and I, I stopped and I had a look at him. It's all changed. And so, you know, that's why I thank God we did movies, you know, because yeah. not, not even the television shows, like you never see Freddie Prince, you know, you know. That uh, Chico and the Man never see any reruns of those, you know. Yeah. But, but, but up in smoke, Chico, everybody's still up in smoke. It's, it, it's a staple. It's a, a rite of childhood passage. In yeah. fact, it, it's a yeah. conversation. If you can't talk up and smoke, then buddy, you better go see that movie. Then we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, uh, I, uh, you, uh, you uh, definitely were a rite of passage in my life. And the reason I'm a comedian, the reason I'm a podcaster now is because of you and because of my mother for having that album where you guys are sitting in the car and then you pull it out and there's weed in the, uh, in the door. <laughs> and what do those cochinos mean any, in English anyway? Two pigs. Two pigs. Okay. Yeah. Two, two dirty guys. Two dirty oh, pigs. Oh, cochino, cochino. <laughs> well, how you did, I, I've had a blast talking to you. I could talk to you all day. If there's anything you want to promote, I know you have CBD products, you have water pipes that you're not going to go to jail for selling. Uh, you Yay. have your own kush, you got all sorts of stuff. Uh, if you want to promote, please promote what, what you have. Uh, what, you mean right now? Yeah, if you want. Uh, no, no, no. Tommy Chong CBD, you know, uh, that's all over the place. And anyway, starting to piss people off. That's a good sign. Okay. Yeah, right I on. turn on my computer and you pop up all the time. So that, that's our <laughs> CBD. And, and Cheech and Chong dispensaries are going to be opening up uh, very, very shortly. Wow. And so, so we'll have that. And, and we'll be on, I'll, I'll, I'll come on your show when that happens. And we'll, that sounds we'll do great. It up right. I would we'll love that. Right. Okay. Hey, uh, Tommy, you're the best. Okay. You are the love you. Thank you. Uh, I, I hope you had a good time. I had such a great time talking to you. It's a dream come true. 
I always have a good time talking about myself. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> bye I can't bye, wait everybody. To try your products. Oh yeah, try it out. And uh, I'm uh, I'm waiting for that uh, goodie bag. It's coming. Guarantee okay. it. Okay. Bye bye. We'll see you have next time. Night.